Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U at Filmmaker U. We create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview film professionals to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by colorist Jatin uh, Patel, whose work includes Mission Impossible Fallout, The Hitman's Bodyguard, and more recently, uh, Breeders. Welcome to the show, Jatin. Hi, nice to have nice nice you. Me. I want to know, how do you get ready for a project? So, like, you've talked to the director and you're, you know, getting on the same page as them. How do you like to prepare for your projects as a colorist? Um, it kind of varies, really, because like obviously it depends if you when are you brought on a project. You know, it's like, so there's quite a few times you just you got you literally on the first session, and you have some communication with the director and DOP, but a lot of it is just like you might see the footage for the first time. Um, so a lot of that is in the suite. You got to hear what they want quickly assess the footage and kind of just implement some ideas <laughs> uh, absolutely like kind of the best scenario is um i like to read the script like to get visual references uh the dp like you know if i've worked with them a lot before then they you know they talk to me a lot about kind of the ideas intention uh sometimes they give me you know, they'll slide through photos of like their prep, um, you know, costume, everything really. So <laughs> I think that's definitely a great start. Um, and then with all that information, you might have a, you probably will have a, like a luck session uh, where you kind of, they've shot some material, hopefully with costume and set design and paint and uh, maybe the actors. So you kind of get an idea of, rough idea of what they want. Um, Sometimes, yeah, you'd want to see a cut, early cut. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you kind of don't want to see any of that because um, seeing the final cut without referencing old old versions is quite refreshing. So you come a fresh point, like some time between that early communication and the start of the grade, mm -hmm. which I quite enjoy because there's no, less preconceived ideas so you come at it from a fresh idea. And some, like, some of the directors and DPs that I work with are quite like that, like that kind of, you come at it from a different um, point, you know, whereas they've had more time with it. So maybe they've just lost sight of certain things and uh, you, yeah, you just have fresher ideas. Yeah. Now uh, we have a lot of young viewers um, who are just starting their careers. Uh, and so they might not have the experience of working with a color. So how do you like to use color as a storytelling tool? Like, what would you tell a young director? The, like, how would you describe it as a storytelling tool to them? Yeah, it's just to, it's to kind of, um, the main aim is to reinforce what your scenes are saying and what mm -hmm. you want to tell the audience subconsciously or consciously, you know, um, and really, you know, understand and get to grips with that idea. Um, you know, how, how do you, how will you use color and light and shadow and shapes to reinforce that story telling beats mm -hmm. um, and how you would, peak, you know, do your peaks and troughs through, through the show or the films and you know, and not so I wouldn't would wouldn't would want to say like to be over um you know overdo it, but sometimes mm -hmm. a film might want a really strong look, you know, and that's the idea of it. Um, but you know, really importantly is to actually be willing to rein that back mm -hmm. you know, because it might interfere with what you're trying to do and especially the actors you know if they're trying to if it's a piece where they're kind of subtle acting you don't want any look to uh, overpower what they're doing you know um so yeah i think really kind of understand before you get to the grade what, what are some doing. some fil projects that you've worked on that required a, a strong look um yeah i worked on a tv show actually called strike back 
um, for Cinemax. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like kind of full on, you know, it was an action show. So it was kind of like full on pumped kind of look. Um, that's the main one that kind of comes to mind. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of any more, but like, you know, that that's definitely a strong, strong. Yeah. <laughs> well, how do you, in that situation, how do you know where the line is? Because, mm. you know, it's one of those things where it's like, it's a strong look, but you don't necessarily know if it's too far without, I guess, showing it to people or, you know, someone yeah, outside yeah. the industry. Yeah, yeah, I kind of like, obviously, like kind of a good, good gauge is a very technical, you know, um, line, you know, like kind of mm -hmm. where, where the image was shot and how was it shot? What exposures? Have you pushed it too far so the image is breaking, you know, mm -hmm. colors ripping? Um, you know, is it starting to do weird things? That's quite a good, <laughs> good, good um, indicator if you've gone too far, you know. Um, yeah, that's the best, probably the best indicator. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you start a project, um, how do you get on the same page as the director? You you talked about um, lookbooks or getting some yeah. some views, but uh, you know it can also be very cryptic sometimes when you're talking to directors. Yeah, no, sure. Like kind of the main, really the most important thing is the ability to listen and um, not to have your preconceived ideas about about the show or the film, kind of. Um, overpower what they want, um, mm -hmm. especially they have that free thought of analyzing what they're saying, what they want, how you're going to implement it, um, and actually just put your kind of ideas to one side sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they can be very cryptic. So then it's about like kind of understanding their language of um, what they, their particular set of language um, indicators of like kind of how, where they want to go. Mm -hmm. um yeah like i said like i said that, that's kind of like yeah the ability to listen and yeah is very very important um because sometimes it won't make sense but you gotta make it, safe, make it safe. <laughs> <laughs> no more blue <laughs> yeah, exactly. i've had it i've had it, I've had it where a, a direct, <laughs> director was saying like i want something warmer so we, like me and the dp were getting like kind of warm yeah like, oranges and yellows right in fact he just wanted warmth uh, it to be cold <laughs> it, was, it was scratching the head. It, it took us a while to understand his language about it. Yeah. And yeah, it was just a funny, funny situation. <laughs> so it's kind of a, He's like, I don't know why you keep making it yeah, colder. Cold. Like, yeah, yeah. I've never heard of anyone seen yeah. it flipped like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what, it, you know, as a colorist, there's a lot of people, it's become a very popular, like a lot of young people want to become colorists nowadays. Mm -hmm what are some of the things that you think young people coming up need to know if they're going to become a color something that might, they might not learn in their schools? I, th I don't know what they teach in those, in the schools because I yeah, came from a different angle, but um, definitely the ability to be patient. Um, maybe, maybe it is something that is taught, but uh, yeah, not to rush, not to, not to, yeah, yeah, not be very, very patient because um, if you work in a facility as well, you've got lots of projects, high, high profile projects. And if you rush into something um, and make a mistake, then that's quite a, you know, it's fine, but it's quite a big thing. <laughs> so you like, I do, I do prescribe to the idea, like kind of the more exposure you have in a less um, pressurized position, you know, where you're not being analyzed so heavily and you see more vari variations, more um, scenarios or projects coming in. That's that's always a, a really important thing to have, because, you know, if you're if you if you've got a good eye for grading, you practice a lot. And on top of that, you have lots of experience in like not lower positions, but more assisting positions and things like that, you know, then it, you'll be better equipped to um, handle those tough, um, tough projects where you're, you know, you're the one who's essentially creating the look and implementing ideas and technically and creatively, you know, uh, you know, it kind of falls on your shoulders. So yeah, patience is a very important thing for me. Yeah. How do you deal with, because before everyone sort of was in the color suite with you, then COVID hit and a lot of people started viewing the color correction at home either on an ipad or 
files mm -hmm. would be sent. How do you deal with the situation that, um, you know, my computer here isn't going to have the same color settings yeah. as yours because you want to make sure that they're not like, oh yeah, it's too blue. I mean, well, yeah. it's just their screen. I mean, I've been quite lucky actually in that situation. Like kind of work with a lot of, uh, you know, directors, DPs, creatives that kind of I've worked with before and trusted um, me and also trust the idea that I'm in the calibrated suite. Um, I think a lot of the time, uh, I think DPs and yeah, they just want to have the ability to see what you're doing and, you know, tell, uh, you know, you know, be part of the process of going, you know, let's put a shape there. And this is what I was thinking about this scene. This is, oh yeah, this, this idea I had then this was a problem. So can we help that um, particular shots or scene and, you know, things like that. So yeah, I guess I've been quite lucky, but there, there have been a, a few situations where there's been question marks about the differences. So it's just a case of explaining, you know, that's not quite what I see or, really have a strong support team where you know calibrated ipads go out and yeah so it's yeah i've been quite lucky i think in that respect. <laughs> but i've heard some stories i've heard some yeah stories. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well what would you say is one of your more challenging scenes that you've had to tackle in your career but that you're really proud of the outcome um yeah i remember actually i remember you know, doing the first pass in a scene on Hitman's Bodyguard. Um, it was like a chase scene of um, in Amsterdam. And I remember started, gra started grading. I think it was like kind of six or 600 or 700 shots, but it was only like 10 or 15 minutes long. And I remember getting to the end of the day and I was like, um, why, why have I only got to like kind of 15 minutes long? And I realized there was a lot of shots and lots of balancing to do because it was shot over two weeks in Amsterdam weather um, and we we're doing lots of things like kind of putting flares in and you know on the headlamps and you know stuff like that so I was doing a lot of that that was quite challenging um, in terms of projects in general mission was quite challenging project um, in general because it was the first time my, my old company did something like that so it was kind of working out the workflow of delivering so many versions, IMAX, 3D, Dolby Vision, HDR, you know, all that kind of stuff. So like, you know, that was a challenging thing, but it worked in the end. Yeah. So for something like that, do you just grade one and then check it on the others and make adjustments or how does that work? Cause I think about, you know, doing a sound mix and and the issues of going to different, different versions, stereo, mono, what have you, is it, what's, what are some of the challenges with that in color? Yeah. So like, I do the make, it's just trying to translate the the main 2D theatrical, you know, 48 nit brightness kind of um, version to these different lum luminance levels once, you know? So like, you kind know, of um, like, you know, retaining, retaining the intention to each version. When you get to the HDRs, obviously you've got a lot more headroom opened up and it's about making sure that headroom is not you know, breaking, you know, you might have pushed too much highlights, but you've got reached a ceiling in your SDR, um, just about controlling those highlights. Um, like grain, for example, was more apparent because it was shot on film. So the grain was more apparent in the HDR version. So we'd have to do a bit more grain reduction. Um, then the home entertainments, we did a 4K version. So it was about, uh, and the theatrical versions, but the 4K versions, the, you know, a lot more grain production involved. So it was just kind of, you end up doing a more technical kind of um, pass. The 3D versions, the luminance levels are dropped to about like three foot Lamberts up through the glasses. So how do you, re, not regrade, but how do you add more shapes to bring detail back to um, areas and make sure your eye goes to um, the action? And in 3D, you kind of really have to focus on one single point on each shot because you don't have the ability to look around as much, you know. Um, yeah, so it's about that kind of stuff, just more technical, but retaining what you uh, what the intention was. For something like 3D, does it like, 
because you know I haven't done a ton of three D stuff so bear with me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but you know, like when I've been in the color suite, it's like okay, we're gonna put a mat here, we're gonna do this, we're gonna shade this little corner. But if we're splitting it out and like separating it so one's closer and one's not, do you have to like remove mats and like or, like or do you see that because you don't want to see you know that this area was shaded a slightly shifting forward or how does that work? Yeah, I think sometimes you go yeah a bit more. If it's a, like a busy shot, you just really want to focus on certain areas. So you really have to kind of creatively um, maybe forget about that area, darken it all the way down, and really just focus on um, your main subject. Um, and obviously, you've got the two eyes, so you've got to make sure that map matches on the left and right eye. Um, and then when you do the depth grade, uh, the stereo grade, it's kind of it's same thing. It's like, where do you want the focus to be? You know, you're not kind of dealing it on the character or is there something in the background? You know, you're doing all the Z depth stuff, you know, but that's why you have the, you know, on mission, we had uh, Corey Turner, who was like, um, yeah, a really great stereographer, you know, so he was, he was doing that, but also, you know, with me in the suite, I was we were just shaping a lot, um, probably further than what the 2D was, you know, because it is, you have to focus on, you really have to drive the eye uh, for the audience. Uh, no. So now, which which do you prefer to work in, like uh, television shows or features? Uh, I like I like both equally. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, like yeah, when you're on a yeah, you, get, you know, when it's a really like you know um, technical feature film, I really enjoy it because I really love the technical side of um, you know the you know of our job. You know, so kind of that's super enjoyable. I love TV shows because you know for story wise for you know there's a bigger arc you know if there's a there's more kind of expansion on like kind of character development and um there's a different technical challenge as well like sometimes i think in the uk like we do things by blocks so you'll get different direct dps for you know like a 10 part series so it's about more of the working with the team, the delegation, it's like, you know, this is what our intention was, you know, stuff like that, but still work with a bigger team, you know? Um, so that's quite enjoyable. I do, I like both for different reasons. I think like, you know, I think, you know, beginning of this year, last year, I was working on a lot of TV shows and I was just like, oh, I'm getting fed up with TV shows. And then I was like, oh, I want to do more features and I'm sure like I'll go to features. I'll be like, oh, I want to go back to TV shows. Yeah. Happy, happy, happy to do both. Equally. Do you find, so, I guess with because at least what I've been seeing in editing and in sound and what have you, um, the post schedules keep getting shorter and shorter. Uh, how do you keep on top and make sure that your quality's still there when you know you have a short schedule? Yeah, I mean, like it's a short schedules and shifting schedules that we're finding at the moment. Um, like kind of grades kind of shift by months and weeks, so it kind of things overlap. You know, the beginning, you know, just beginning of the year, like five TV jobs all overlapping each other. I think at one point I had like, you know, 20, maybe 25 episodes all open, all the VFX coming in. It just, it just meant I had to get to work very early in the morning. Look at the, look at VFX shots, updates, re, you know, recuts, do the main, do the main grade day in the middle, maybe for lunch, have a quick, you know, 15 minute lunch and then checking things and then spending the evening. So it was like 11, 11 hour days, 11, 12 hour days for that kind of stuff, you know? So you just really got to put in the hours for that one. That but you, scenarios, yeah. So your eyes are probably like the, the most important part of your job. So how do you protect your eyes then to make sure that you don't wear them out? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I don't think I do a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went for my eye test recently, first time in two years. So that was a good, good, good start. Um, yeah, I think, I think working in the dark for so long, I've got like kind of uh, photo, photo sensitivity. Um, yeah, just getting good good night's sleep and looking after your eyes, really, I think. Yeah. And not straining them. I try to like, yeah, if it's a difficult day at work or long period of long hours, I don't tend to watch much at home. I just kind of just switch off, really. Um, it does mean I kind of don't keep up with things as much as you'd like but you know you've got to go back to, back into it the next day yeah so yeah now i have one last question for you you know we've been stuck in this pandemic for or sorry we've 
Uh, let me take that again, Jason. Uh, I have one last question for you. Hey, what would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film to watch? Really, I don't think I, I don't think I have one. <laughs> <laughs> or TV show. TV show. The way I say it to people usually is because people will be like, "Well, what do you mean?" You know, it's Sunday afternoon. It's like one thirty-five. You're like flipping around on the channels because you have nothing to do, and you're like, "Oh, this movie's yeah. on. I'll watch it." Not really. I kind of, I kind of watch a lot of YouTube. Um, yeah. YouTube channels and stuff like that. You know. Kind of, what's What's your go-to YouTube channel? Quite like Matty Madison, like a cooking guy. You know, he's quite fun. Um, you know, Linus Tech Tips. You know that. Kind oh, of I'm stuff. addicted to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then. Um, day 2d you know all technical stuff i kind of watch this <laughs> watch this guy who's kind of living in the wilderness and he kind of he's building just building woodworker carpenter so he does lots of videos about that you know uh, just building his massive workshops and house you know it's kind of really things that you just switch off switch off on you know <laughs> so if you're if you're watching linus tech tips are you into like home automation and that stuff or is it just the computer stuff that you watch yeah, i quite quite like um corridor crew as well that's, that's oh, yeah. the effects the effects kind of um show uh yeah kind of i watch those kind of things just like to keep up on technical stuff and yeah the effects and things like that, you know so the know. one the one that drives me nuts is there's one where there's like a group of guys and they just judge vfx and i'm like but they you don't understand all the stuff that's happening behind the I know, scenes. I, I, think might, I, think, I think it might. I think it might be that one. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I quite like it because they get the like, they get the uh, VFX supervisors in. Oh no, it's definitely not that one because this one they were. One. Yeah, this one they were like, let's redo the VFX from Scorpion King or whatever it was, which was that like was it. twenty. That's it. That's it. Oh yeah, because yeah, it was like twenty yeah, yeah. years ago, and I was like, the technology yeah. wasn't even that. There's a, recent, guys, there's a recent, yeah, there's a recent video. It was just out, I think, last week, the week before, where they actually got the VFX guy, um, the VFX supervisor who did that shot. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah, you should check that out because he was just like, yeah, I know. You kind of, you kind of picked up, picked apart that for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but, yeah, thank I you. Think, so... no Sorry. No, no, no. I, no. I was going to say thank you so much for letting me interview you today. No, no. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's been really great to talk to you. And, and that's it for this week, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching and make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.